A Little Princess by Frances Hodgson Burnett Retold by Mina Morris Chapter 7 The Diamond Mines Again when Sarah walked into the schoolroom that was decorated with holly, she was leading a small group. Miss Minchin, wearing her best silk dress, was holding Sarah's hand. A man who worked in the house carried a box with a special doll in it. A woman who worked in the house carried another box, and Becky, who also worked there, carried a third box. She was wearing a clean apron and a new hat. Sarah would have liked to come in by herself, but Miss Minchin had asked for her. After they talked in Miss Minchin's private room, Miss Minchin said she wanted things done this way. This is a special day, Miss Minchin said. We should not treat it like a normal day. So, Sarah was brought into the room in a fancy way. She felt shy when the older girls looked at her and whispered to each other, and the younger ones wiggled happily in their seats. Be quiet, girls, Miss Minchin said when they started making noise. James, put the box on the table and open it. Emma, put yours on a chair. Becky, she said suddenly and in a strict voice. Becky was so excited that she was smiling at Lottie, another girl, and almost dropped her box when Miss Minchin spoke. She was so surprised that she made a funny bow to say sorry. Lavinia and Jessie, two other girls, laughed quietly. You should not look at the girls, Miss Minchin told Becky. Remember your place. Put your box down. Becky quickly did as she was told and moved towards the door. You can leave now, Miss Minchin told the workers, waving her hand. Becky waited for the others to leave first. She looked longingly at the box on the table, where she could see something blue and shiny peeking out. Miss Minchin, Sarah said suddenly, can Becky stay? This was a brave thing to ask. Miss Minchin was so surprised that she jumped a little. Then... She looked at Sarah through her glasses, confused. Becky, she said, my dear Sarah. Sarah moved closer to her. I want her to stay because she will like the gifts, Sarah explained. She is a young girl, too. Miss Minchin was shocked. She looked from Sarah to Becky. My dear Sarah, she said. Becky works in the kitchen. Kitchen workers are not young girls. She had never thought of them that way. She thought they were just workers. But Becky is a young girl, said Sarah, and she would be happy here. Please let her stay because today is my birthday. Miss Minchin answered with importance. Since it's your birthday, she can stay. Becky, thank Sarah for being so kind. Becky, who had been nervously waiting, came forward, making little bows. She and Sarah shared a look of friendship as she thanked her excitedly. Oh, thank you, miss. I am so thankful. I really wanted to see the doll. Thank you, miss. And thank you, ma'am, she added, turning to Miss Minchin and bowing quickly, for letting me be here. Miss Minchin waved her hand towards a corner near the door. Go and stand over there, she ordered, not too close to the other girls. 
Becky went to her spot, smiling. She was just happy to be in the room, not in the kitchen, during this exciting time. She didn't even mind when Miss Minchin cleared her throat loudly and started to speak. Now, girls, I have something to say to you, Miss Minchin said. She's going to give a speech, whispered one girl. I wish it was over. Sarah felt a bit uncomfortable. Since this was her party, the speech was probably about her. It's not nice to be the centre of attention while someone talks about you in a classroom. You all know Miss Minchin started, and it was clear she was giving a speech that today is Sarah's eleventh birthday. Dear Sarah, Lavinia said softly, some of you have also turned eleven, but Sarah's birthdays are different. When she grows up, she will have a lot of money, and she will have to use it well. The diamond mines, Jessie giggled quietly. Sarah didn't hear her. She was looking straight at Miss Minchin, feeling a bit warm. She didn't like it when Miss Minchin talked about money and it felt wrong to dislike adults. When her father, Captain Crewe, left her with me, Miss Minchin continued, he joked, she will be very rich. I said, her education here will match her wealth. Sarah is a great student. Her French and dancing are excellent. Her manners, which make you call her Princess Sarah, are perfect. She shows her kindness by having this party. I hope you are thankful. Let's all say, thank you, Sarah, together. Everyone stood up, just like they did on another day, Sarah remembered. Thank you, Sarah, they said. Lottie even jumped around. Sarah looked a bit shy, then made a nice curtsy. Thank you, she said, for coming to my party. Very good, Sarah, said Miss Minchin. That's what a princess does, Lavinia, she said sharply. That noise was rude. If you're jealous, be more polite. Now have fun. As soon as Miss Minchin left, the room changed. Everyone left their seats quickly. The girls rushed to the boxes. Sarah opened one and smiled. These must be books, she said. The younger kids seemed disappointed and Ermengarde was surprised. Does your dad send you books for your birthday? She asked. That's just like my dad. Don't open them, Sarah. I like them, Sarah laughed and turned to the biggest box. Inside was a beautiful doll. The kids were amazed, making excited sounds and stepping back to look at it. She's as big as Lottie, someone said in awe. Lottie was very happy and danced around, laughing. She's dressed like she's going to the theatre, said Lavinia. Her coat is really fancy. Oh, Ermengarde said excitedly. She has a small telescope for watching shows, and it's blue and gold. Here's her suitcase, said Sarah. Let's open it and see her things. Sarah sat on the floor and unlocked the suitcase. The children gathered around her, excited, as she showed them what was inside. The room was very noisy. There were fancy collars, silk socks and handkerchiefs. There was a long coat with fur 
many dresses for different occasions, hats, gowns for tea and fans. Even Lavinia and Jessie, who thought they were too old for dolls, were amazed and started looking at the items. Imagine, Sarah said, standing by the table and putting a big black hat on the doll, if she could understand us, and was happy to be admired. You always imagine things, said Lavinia, acting like she knew better. I do, Sarah replied, not bothered. I like it. It's fun to imagine. It's almost like being magical. If you imagine something a lot, it feels real. It's easy for you to imagine things when you have everything, said Lavinia. Could you do it if you were poor and lived in a small attic room? Sarah stopped fixing the doll's feathers and thought. I think I could, she said. If you were poor, you would have to imagine and pretend all the time. But it might be hard. Right after she said this, Miss Amelia came into the room. Sarah, she said, your dad's lawyer, Mr. Barrow, is here to see Miss Minchin. She needs to talk to him alone, and since the snacks are in her room, you should all have your party now. This way she can talk here. Snacks are always welcome, and everyone was excited. Miss Amelia made everyone line up, and with Sarah leading, they left the room. The doll was left sitting with her clothes all around her, dresses and coats on chairs, and piles of petticoats on the seats. Becky, who wasn't supposed to join the party, stopped to admire the clothes, which she really shouldn't have done. Go back to your work, Becky, Miss Amelia said. But Becky was so amazed by the muffin coat that she didn't move. When she heard Miss Minchin coming, she was scared of getting in trouble and quickly hid under the table covered by the tablecloth. Miss Minchin entered with a small, serious-looking man, Mr. Barrow. They both seemed upset. Miss Minchin looked at Mr. Barrow with a confused and annoyed face. She sat down formally and told him to sit, too. Please sit down, Mr. Barrow, she said. Mr. Barrow didn't sit down right away. He looked at the last doll and her things. He put on his glasses and seemed not to like what he saw. The doll just sat there, not bothered by him. A hundred pounds, Mr. Barrow said. All this is expensive, from Paris. That man spent a lot of money. Miss Minchin felt upset. She thought Mr. Barrow was being rude about her best customer. Excuse me, Mr. Barrow, she said in a formal way. I don't understand what you mean. Birthday gifts, Mr. Barrow said, still critical for an eleven-year-old. That's too much. Miss Minchin became even more serious. Captain Crewe is rich, she said. He has diamond mines. Mr. Barrow turned quickly. Diamond mines, he said loudly. There are none. They don't exist. Miss Minchin was so shocked that she stood up. What, she said. What are you saying? Well, Mr. Barrow said, getting annoyed. It would be better if they didn't exist. No diamond mines, Miss Minchin said, holding on to a chair, feeling like she was losing something wonderful. Diamond mines often bring trouble, not wealth, Mr. Barrow said. If a man isn't good at business and trusts a close friend with mines, 
it's usually bad. Captain Crewe! Miss Minchin interrupted him, shocked. Captain Crewe is dead, she said. You mean he's... Yes, he's dead, Mr Barrow said quickly. He died of fever and business problems. The fever and the problems together were too much. He's gone. Miss Minchin sat down, very worried. What were his business problems? she asked. Diamond mines, Mr Barrow said, and the close friend, and losing everything. Miss Minchin couldn't believe it. Lost everything, she said. Yes, all his money, Mr Barrow said. His friend was obsessed with the diamond mine. He used all his money and all of Captain Crewe's. Then he ran away. Captain Crewe was already sick when he heard. It was too much for him. He died upset thinking about his daughter and left nothing. Miss Minchin realised the situation. She felt like she had lost everything important to her school. She felt wronged by Captain Crewe, Sarah and Mr Barrow. Do you mean he left nothing, she said. Sarah has no money. The girl is poor. She's left with me, with no money, instead of being rich. Mr Barrow, knowing business, wanted to be clear that he wasn't responsible. She is indeed poor he said, and she is left with you, ma'am, as she has no family that we know of. Miss Minchin was so upset that she almost ran out of the room to stop the party going on with the snacks. It's outrageous, she said. She's in my room right now, wearing silk and lace, having a party that I'm paying for. She's having it at your cost, madam, Mr Barrow said calmly. Our company, Barrow and Skipworth, isn't paying for anything. Captain Crewe lost all his money. He didn't even pay our last bill, and it was a large one. Miss Minchin was even more angry. She turned away from the door. This is what's happened to me, she said. I always trusted his payments, so I spent a lot on the child. I paid for the fancy doll and her clothes. She had everything she wanted. She even had a carriage, a pony and a maid, and I paid for them all since the last money he sent. Mr Barrow didn't want to stay and listen to Miss Minchin's complaints. He had already explained his firm's position and the basic facts. He didn't feel sorry for someone who ran a boarding school and was angry. You shouldn't pay for anything else, Mum, he advised, unless you want to give gifts to the girl. No one will thank you. She has no money at all. But what should I do? Miss Minchin asked as if it was his job to solve her problem. What am I supposed to do? There's nothing you can do, Mr Barrow said, putting away his glasses. Captain Crewe is dead. The girl has no money. You're the only one responsible for her. I'm not responsible for her, and I won't be. Miss Minchin was very angry. Mr. Barrow was ready to leave. That's not my concern, madam, he said, not interested. Our company is not responsible. I'm sorry this happened, of course. If you think I'll take care of her, you're wrong, Miss Minchin said angrily. I've been tricked and stolen from. I'll throw her out. She was so angry that she said more than she should have. She realised she might be stuck with a child she didn't want 
and lost her temper. Mr. Barrow was leaving. I wouldn't do that, madam, he said. It wouldn't look good. It would be bad for your school's reputation if people heard you threw out a student with no money and no friends. He knew what he was talking about as a business person. He also knew Miss Minchin was smart in business and would understand. She couldn't afford to be seen as mean and heartless. You should keep her and use her skills, he suggested. She's smart. You can benefit from her as she gets older. I will benefit from her before she's older, Miss Minchin said. I'm sure you will, ma'am, Mr. Barrow said with a small, knowing smile. I'm sure you will. Good morning. Mr. Barrow left the room and closed the door behind him. Miss Minchin stood there for a while, staring at the door. She knew what he said was true. She had no way to get back the money she spent on her best student, who was now just a poor, friendless girl. Feeling very upset, she heard happy voices from the room where the party was happening. She decided to stop it. As she was about to open the door, Miss Amelia opened it from the other side. Seeing Miss Minchin's angry face, she stepped back, scared. What's wrong, sister? she asked. Miss Minchin's voice was almost harsh. Where is Sarah Crewe? Miss Amelia was confused. Sarah, she said. She's in your room with the children. Does she have a black dress in all her fancy clothes? Miss Minchin asked with sarcasm. A black dress, Miss Amelia repeated, surprised. A black one? Does she have one of any other colour but black? Miss Amelia started to look worried. No, well, yes, she said, but it's too small for her now. She has only an old black velvet dress and it's too short. Tell her to change out of that pink silk dress and put on the black one, even if it's too short. She's done with fancy clothes. Miss Amelia began to cry. Oh, sister, she cried. What's happened? Miss Minchin didn't waste words. Captain Crewe is dead, she said. He left no money. That spoiled child is now poor and left with me. Miss Amelia sat down, shocked. I've spent so much on her for nothing, she said. Stop her party. Tell her to change her dress now. Me, Miss Amelia said, shocked. Should I tell her right now? Right now, Miss Minchin said firmly. Go, don't just sit there. Go! Miss Amelia, used to being called silly, knew she had to do it, even though it was hard. She wiped her eyes, making them red, then stood up and left the room without saying more. When her sister was this angry, it was best to just do as told, without talking back. Miss Minchin walked around talking to herself. She had hoped to make money from the diamond mine story. She had dreamed of making a fortune, but now she was facing losses. The Princess Sarah, indeed, she said angrily. She was treated like a queen. She was passing a table when she heard a loud crying sound from under it. What is that? she said, angry. She heard the sob again and lifted the tablecloth. How dare you? 
she shouted. It was Becky who came out from under the table, her cap crooked and her face red from trying not to cry. Please, Mum, it's me, she said. I know I shouldn't have, but I was looking at the doll, Mum, and got scared when you came in, so I hid under the table. You were there the whole time, listening Miss Minchin accused her. No, Mum, Becky hurried to say, curtsying. I wasn't listening. I just couldn't leave without you noticing, so I had to stay. But I wasn't listening on purpose, Mum. Then Becky suddenly seemed less afraid of Miss Minchin. She started crying again. Oh, please, ma'am, she begged. I know you might fire me, but I feel so sad for Miss Sara. I'm really sorry. Get out of the room, Miss Minchin commanded. Becky kept crying as she curtsied. Yes, ma'am, I'll go, she said, shaking. But please, I want to ask you something. Miss Sara was a rich young lady who had everything done for her. What will she do now without a maid? If you'd allow me, after I finish my kitchen work, I'd like to help her, now that she's poor. Oh, she cried more, poor Miss Sara, who was like a princess. This made Miss Minchin even angrier. She couldn't stand that even the kitchen maid was on Sarah's side. A child she realised she never liked. No, absolutely not, she snapped. Sarah will do her own work and others' work too. Leave now or you'll lose your job. Becky ran away, covering her face with her apron. She went to the kitchen and cried among the pots and pans. It's just like in the stories, she sobbed, like those poor princesses who were sent into the world. Later, when Sarah came to Miss Minchin's room after being called, Miss Minchin was as stern and cold as ever. For Sarah, it felt like the birthday party was either a dream or something from a long time ago happening to a different little girl. The schoolroom was back to normal, with no signs of the party. Miss Minchin was in her usual dress, and everything was as it always was. The students had changed out of their party dresses and were back in the classroom talking excitedly. Tell Sarah to come here, Miss Minchin had told her sister. Make sure she knows I don't want any crying or scenes. Sister, Miss Amelia answered, she's a strange child. She didn't make a fuss at all. You remember she didn't when her father went back to India. When I told her what happened, she just stood there quietly and looked at me. Her eyes got bigger and she turned pale. After I finished, she just stared for a bit. Then her chin shook and she ran out and upstairs. Some of the other children started crying but she didn't seem to notice them or anything else, I said. It was strange not getting any response, especially when you tell something so shocking and unexpected. No one knew what happened in Sarah's room after she ran upstairs and locked the door. Sarah herself barely remembered anything except walking back and forth, repeating in a voice that didn't seem like hers, My papa is dead. My papa is dead. At one point, she stopped in front of Emily, her doll, who was sitting in a chair. Sarah cried out, 
Emily, do you hear? Papa is dead. He is dead in India, far away. When she entered Miss Minchin's sitting room, her face was pale and her eyes had dark circles around them. Her lips were tightly closed, hiding her pain. She didn't look like the happy child who had enjoyed the party in the schoolroom. Instead, she looked lonely and different. She wore the old black velvet dress without Mariette's help. It was too short and tight. Her thin legs looked long under the short skirt. Her thick black hair was loose and messy, making her pale face stand out. She was holding Emily, wrapped in a piece of black cloth. Put down your doll, Miss Minchin ordered. Why did you bring her here? No, Sarah said. I won't put her down. She's all I have left. My papa gave her to me. Sarah always made Miss Minchin feel uneasy, and she did now too. Sarah's calmness made Miss Minchin struggle, maybe because she knew she was being unkind. You won't have time for dolls now, Miss Minchin said. You'll need to work and be useful. Sarah just looked at her, saying nothing. Everything will change, Miss Minchin continued. I guess Miss Amelia told you already. Yes, Sarah replied. My papa is dead. I have no money. I'm poor. You are a beggar, Miss Minchin said, getting angry. You have no family or home. No one to care for you. Sarah's face twitched but she stayed quiet. What are you staring at? Miss Minchin snapped. Don't you understand? You're alone, and no one will help you unless I do it out of kindness. I understand, Sarah said quietly, as if swallowing something in her throat. That doll, Miss Minchin said, pointing to Emily, that silly doll and her expensive things. I paid for her. Sarah looked at the doll. The last doll, she said softly. The last doll. Her voice was sad. The last doll, indeed, Miss Minchin said. And she's mine, not yours. Everything you own is mine. Then please take it, Sarah said. I don't want it. If Sarah had cried or seemed scared, Miss Minchin might have been more patient. But as she looked at Sarah's calm, serious face and heard her steady voice, Miss Minchin felt like she was losing control. Don't act proud, she said. That time is over. You're not a princess now. Your carriage and pony will be gone, and your maid will be fired. You'll wear your old and simple clothes. Your fancy ones don't fit your life now. You're like Becky. You have to work for a living. To Miss Minchin's surprise, Sarah seemed a bit relieved. Can I work? she asked. If I can work, it's not so bad. What can I do? You'll do whatever you're told, Miss Minchin answered. You're smart and learn quickly. If you're useful, I might let you stay. You speak French well, so you can help with the younger children. May I? Sarah said eagerly. Please let me. I think I can teach them. I like them and they like me. Don't be silly about people liking you, Miss Minchin scolded. You'll do more than teach. You'll run errands, help in the kitchen and the classroom. If you don't make me happy, you'll be sent away. Remember that. 
Now go. Sarah stood there, thinking deeply. Then she started to leave. Stop, Miss Minchin called out. Aren't you going to thank me? Sarah stopped, filled with strong emotions. For what? she asked. For being kind, Miss Minchin said, for giving you a home. Sarah stepped forward, her chest rising and falling. You are not kind, she said firmly. This is not a home. Then she ran out before Miss Minchin could react, leaving her in shock and anger. Sarah walked upstairs slowly, holding Emily close. I wish she could talk, she thought. If only she could. She planned to go to her room, lie on the tiger skin and think. But before she got there, Miss Amelia came out of a door and stood there, looking uncomfortable. She felt bad about what she had to do. You can't go in there, she told Sarah. Not go in? Sarah asked, stepping back in surprise. That's not your room anymore, Miss Amelia said, a bit embarrassed. Sarah suddenly understood. This was the change Miss Minchin had mentioned. Where is my room now? she asked, trying to sound steady. You'll sleep in the attic next to Becky. Sarah knew where the attic was because Becky had told her about it. She walked up two sets of stairs. The last one was narrow, with old, worn carpet strips. She felt like she was leaving behind the world where she used to live. This new Sarah, in her tight old dress, climbing up to the attic, was a completely different person. When she opened the attic door, her heart felt sad. Then she closed the door, leaned against it, and looked around. This place was definitely different. The room had a sloping ceiling and was painted white, but the paint was dirty and peeling in places. Old furniture that couldn't be used downstairs was in the attic. Sarah sat on it, holding Emily, her doll. She didn't cry. She just put her face down on Emily, hugged her, and sat there quietly. As she sat there in silence, there was a quiet knock at the door. It was so soft she almost didn't hear it. The door opened a bit, and Becky's tear-stained face peeked in. Becky had been crying quietly for hours. Oh, miss, she whispered. May I, could I come in? Sarah lifted her head and looked at Becky. She tried to smile, but couldn't. Then, seeing the sadness in Becky's eyes, her face looked more childlike. She held out her hand and let out a small sob. Oh, Becky, she said, I said we were the same, just two little girls. Now you see it's true. I'm not a princess any more. Becky rushed to her, took her hand and held it close, kneeling beside her and crying. Yes, miss, you are, she sobbed. No matter what happens, you're still a princess. Nothing can change that. End of chapter 7